Welcome to WOW, the Women of the Week podcast series by Pharma Voice. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship from Cardinal Health Specialty Solutions. For more information, please visit cardinalhealth.com slash specialty solutions. In this episode, Taryn meets with Anna Sundgren, PhD, Senior Director, Renal Disease at AstraZeneca. Anna, welcome to the Pharma Voice WOW podcast program. Thank you so much for having me, Taryn. Oh, it's our pleasure. Anna, can you please provide some context around a chronic kidney disease? I know that this is a passion for you. I also recognize that there's been little innovation in treatment advances in more than 30 years, but the prevalence is still increasing. And then we'll move into how this plays into your role as Senior Director of Renal Disease at AstraZeneca. Absolutely. Like you said, the innovation in this area has been bleak over the past 30 years. And uh, to really give some flavor to the numbers, I think, Taryn, uh, it's important to think about the growth of, of deaths in this area. And it actually has doubled since 1990. And the reason for why this happens is because when the kidney function declines and the kidney gets less and less capacity to filter urine, um, we get complications uh, from that when the body is reacting to a poor kidney function. And that leads to cardiovascular death. And essentially, people succumb to this before they get transplants. So uh, as the amount of, of, of patients with chronic kidney diseases are increasing, then, of course, we see more people uh, succumbing to, to this horrible disease, which is really quite insidious and hard to know that you have, in fact. So innovation is very important. So with the new scientific understanding we have in the area, we, we have the ability, really, to address this now uh, in ways that we probably didn't have 30 years ago. And so, uh, for me, it's a very important area of research. Excellent. So talk to me about what your role is at AstraZeneca as a senior director for that renal disease business unit. Yes, absolutely. I'd be delighted to. So um, I have kind of two hats, if you will, in the company. I work with the renal strategy, and I started that about five years ago when there was fewer than five or ten people caring about renal disease in the company. And so since then, I've sort of worked with building a strategic way forward for AstraZeneca and renal disease. Uh, but I also have uh, the role of, of a global development leader in the company where I have the uh, honor, if you will, to uh, be involved in the research and development. So really driving through large global teams uh, the delivery of new data and trial data for registration and reimbursement so that the new drugs that we de develop in chronic kidney disease actually reaches patients across the world. So those are the two roles that I have. And, of course, both of them are very, very tied to chronic kidney disease. I understand that you have a very personal story regarding chronic yeah. kidney disease. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? Uh, not at all, not at all. In the beginning when I started talking about it, 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 was, it really moved me and was hard to talk about. But now it's almost yeah, uh, nine years ago. So my mom died in 2010. Uh, and I've always been very interested in research and development, but it wasn't until my mom passed away uh, when she was on dialysis that I really found my purpose, I think, and, and really was able to channel all of my passion into research and development into chronic kidney disease. And my mom, she, um, she had an underlying disease, so she wasn't eligible to get a transplant, which meant that for her, um, dialysis was kind of the end end of the line, and um, she was a very um, impressive woman, I think. She loved to walk out into the woods with her dog and pick mushrooms, and she loved to paint and a lot of things. And she, she, she lived in the countryside in Sweden, and to get to the dialysis center for her took a whole day. And then when you're in the dialysis chair, um, it's, it's very um, tiring. So the day of dialysis, you're ex absolutely exhausted when you come back. And then you have one day, right, at home, and then you have to go back in and do dialysis. And so 
quality of her life uh, really um, dropped to horrible levels. She couldn't do anything. She was always fatigued. Uh, she couldn't do anything that she loved and felt that she was uh, really tied down to this dialysis chair. And so in the end, she actually chose to stop dialysis. And what that means is that when you, don't, when you can't clean your blood and your kidneys are not functioning, um, you go into a coma and you pass away. So she, uh, she did that in 2010, and I was really upset by she had the fact that she had decided to, to leave us. But um, it, uh, as I said, it gave me a lot of, a lot of uh, passion to try and, t- and treat this disease in the future. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is devastating, and I'm sorry for your loss. And thank it you. takes us so much courage to keep going and address an area that is so personal to you. Let's talk about the areas where you see the greatest innovation going to happen in that uh, chronic kidney disease space. Where do you see a lot of excitement? What's hot right now there? There's a lot that's hot. I want to say that in the beginning. So it, just to level set, I think innovation and really um, uh, discovering new ways of, of, of addressing issues or matters on a global scale in any kind of business is, is very important. And I think for being wor- working in R&D uh, and doing that is, is, is very rewarding. And for CKD, and I mentioned in the beginning that there's been a lot of of new, new scientific findings that help us deliver new medicines in chronic kidney disease. And then there's particularly three areas that, are, that have really moved lately. And one, if we sort of group them, there, there's two areas uh, that sort of goes to complications. And so when the function declines, I said in the beginning, um, you, you start getting complications of your poor renal function. And there are two areas uh, of, of complications management that have really moved. One is um, potassium levels. When you have poor function, kidney function, you can't clear your potassium levels from the blood. And uh, if you can't clear your potassium levels, you run the risk of sudden cardiac death and arrhythmias. Recently, there have been developments in how we can selectively bind this potassium ion and clear it from the blood through, through the gut, essentially. And uh, that's a very, very good um, new innovation that's coming to, to the renal patients very, very soon. Uh, it, uh, in, in, in the U.S., AstraZeneca is actually uh, launching uh, one new medication, medicine here. And, and, and in, in the world, of course, it's coming. And we have two, two new medicines in this area. Uh, that's not, not AstraZeneca as both of them. But, uh, uh, and this will help a lot of patients, absolutely. And then staying with complications, there's another one which actually my mom suffered a lot from, uh, which, which really results in, in like a, a fatigue that's, that's uh, debilitating. You, you, you basically just observe the world from outside of your body. You're not really feeling any energy to do anything, and that's renal anemia. Mm. So when the renal function declines, there's a, there's a protein that's produced in the kidney, which is called erythropoietin. And uh, treating the anemia in a different way uh, is also something that has, uh, has come up very recently. And a new medicine that's launching across the world as well in renal anemia. So two very new uh, innovations coming in complications management. We shouldn't forget that we treat complications, but we also need to stop the progressive decline of the renal function. And here, um, there's a lot of new interest in a a mechanism called SGLT2s, which is a way to stop uh, the kidney function to decline fast. And and AstraZeneca has one of these medicines, and and there's also uh, several good options out there already where there's research ongoing to prove uh, that actually the kidneys are protected if you take these medicines. And so together, these are three extremely interesting uh, new innovations that will reach patients. uh, uh, And it will help patients from having to to get transplants, uh, which is is really important, and and save uh, also patients from having to go on to dialysis, hopefully, if they're used effectively. Those are exciting innovations, not only from a disease standpoint, but as you said, from a quality of life standpoint. Do you think these new medicines would ever bring to bear the fact that folks may not ever have to go on dialysis again, or are we still 
ways from that. No, I think I think our vision, if you will, for the longer term is is to really uh, be able to diagnose chronic kidney disease early. And if we treat it effectively with our new medicines that are coming into the renal space, uh, effectively stop patients from, from having to go on to dialysis and, and essentially uh, succumb to something else, if you will. The CKD will never really be the reason for why they pass away. And they would ha- never have to go on to, to dialysis, hopefully, or need a transplant. Well, I wish you continued success. This is such an important therapeutic area, and it just it means so much to so many people out there. Yeah, so, I completely agree with you. I noted on your bio you have been at AstraZeneca for more than 18 years. That's a long run at one company. I'd yeah. love to know what has kept you at AZ for all these years. Yeah, I wonder about that myself sometimes, but um, <laughs> if somebody asking it like you did, Taryn, I started reflecting on it, and, and of course, you know, what you do every day, um, if you always do the same thing, you start knowing it really, really well, and of course, then you want to move on and do something else, um, but um, AstraZeneca has always been a company that allows personal growth and continuous learning, and with that, then you acquire skills that allows you to move in the organization. And uh, you, if you do that and you get a new job, uh, you know, it feels like you're changing company almost. So for me, I've been working on very many different continents for AstraZeneca in very many different roles. And so uh, 18, it doesn't feel like 18 years. I can't even <laughs> believe it myself sometimes. Yeah. It's funny, right, when you look up and go, ooh, that's 18 years already. Um, um, Let's talk about your international experience. You've had a number of global roles. And so how does that, you know, world perspective inform your vision, your strategic decision-making, and your leadership style? I must say I've really enjoyed the international uh, work that I've done. And it's really opened me up for that, heterogeneity and uh, uh, different perspectives, uh, which often actually stems from coming from a different culture, um, really helps us uh, move things along in a more sensible way. So let me just explain that a little bit. So we all have biases, right? I mean, that stems from who I am and, and, and my culture and how I grew up and what I've have learned, right? Uh, But when we come from very similar backgrounds, it's really easy to sort of get stuck in a group think and almost not, I mean, you have the same blind spots, I guess is what I'm saying. But when you're uh, interacting with international teams, we all still have biases. I'm not saying that, but we have different biases, which means that we can sort of see matters together from different perspectives. And I have the greatest respect for that, uh, where I, I feel that international placements uh, for myself has made me see that. And working in teams that are truly global uh, really uh, brings more value, I think, than, than, than teams that are, are more um, um, similar as such. I agree. I think that you're right. I think that that diversity of culture, that diversity of thought, that diversity of perspective really does make for a stronger team dynamic and therefore Mm -hmm. a stronger product. Um, Mm -hmm. But let's face it, managing global teams requires quite a bit of balance. Do you have any tips or techniques that you've learned along the way that you have found to be really helpful in managing across different time zones, different cultures, Hmm. Yeah, you're right, Taryn. I mean, I think it does have sort of a, an upside and a downside. And the downside always when you work in global teams is that, of course, you're not in the same place. And uh, effective teams do, do work really well when they're in the same room together. And so I think if you'll allow me to go a little bit tactical first, and then um, we can talk a little bit more about uh, the, 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 the biases uh, later on. But I think tactically, you know, you have to um, – allow for uh, the, the meeting technology being 
not always optimal and takes time to make sure that you have the right technology to, to meet effectively. And another thing is language barriers, right? We're all talking English, but I'm not a native speaker in English, and, and the team members are, aren't either. So it's a matter of like making sure that you, you speak in, a, in an easy way and that you have something written down, you know, as well as when you say it, so that people can return to it and really make sure that they've understood. Um, and then I think one thing which is also very common is the 24-hour working, right? So if I have a team in Japan and China, Europe and, and, and the U.S., it's essentially um, the team as an entity is working for 24 hours. And so it's a matter of setting your own boundaries that, okay, now, now Japan is working and I'm not going to respond to any emails even though it lands in my inbox at like 1 a.m. in the morning. So, so it, both both good and bad, I think, there. Uh, uh, and respect for, that's where I wanted to end, end up also. I think respect for, for culture. Uh, so it ties a little bit back to, to, the, to, the, to bias and the, the culture that we're living in, right? I think with a global team, you really have to have respect for religious events and holidays and the fact that people in Sweden go out for four weeks in July on vacation and, and you still have to get things going in the global team. And so, uh, so, so there are things that you have to consider, but if you're willing to work around these things and really make sure that it works, that reward in terms of a heterogeneous global team is, is great, I think. That's, that's great insight. And I, yes, that 1 a.m. email, no. But I do like the four-week vacation thing in Sweden. That sounds awesome. Again, along a similar vein, you know, you are sitting in an executive level role. What lessons have you learned along the way that might benefit other women who are looking to ascend uh, to that level? Yes. That's a really interesting question, I think, uh, Tarana. And uh, when I was younger in the organization, I think I, I tried to – and sort of behave in the way that I thought was needed, um, maybe being more uh, agentic uh, leadership style and male in my way of working, if you will. But as I've grown older and become more sure of myself, I think I've, 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 I've um, realized that it's really uh, more of a transformational leader style that's important, and especially in innovative businesses. And in that, you know, a female leadership style is really, really valuable. So I've become much more myself. I'm trying to be really authentic and, and really bringing what I am to the team. And for instance, I'm a ballroom dancer, which is a very girly thing to be, right? But I'm very proud of it, you know. I, I like the team to, to know that, and I share things, and I try to be who I am, you know, uh, and uh, lead my team with, uh, I with uh, engagement and positive uh, direction. That's awesome. What's your specialty in ballroom? <laughs> I do the 10 dances, the 10 core dances, uh, but I love any kind of dancing. Do you dance yourself, Taryn? I do not, but I am so thrilled to hear. So I, I've never met a ballroom dancer before, so <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, um, it's really good exercise, actually. I've Very seen fun. them on TV. I, I yeah. think it's amazing the things that you all can do. So obviously there's level, different levels of success. There's personal success. There's professional success. And how do you define success for you? I think I'm internally motivated as a person, and I know I am, and, and feeling good about achieving something in general. It's good. The smaller everyday thing is feeling good about having uh, done something well, right? But – if I take the bigger picture, it's more about leaving something that's greater than me behind, if you will. And especially since my mom passed away, I, I've really, for the past five years, had a very strong uh, 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 success definition of, of, of leaving treatments behind me, if you will, that, that can help uh, patients with CKD. And so for me, sort of that legacy will be, will, will be my success. Uh, and that's why I'm so delighted to be able to work both on the strategy now as well as uh, two of our core brands that in, within research and development. That's exciting. Are you a mentor to other women in the organization? 
I, I have been mentors off and on uh, uh, for, for quite a while. And uh, my latest uh, uh, mentee, she, um, she left the company a little while ago. She chose to do something else. But I, I really enjoy that, actually. It, talking with, the, with the, I mean, having mentors and being a, a mentor is very, very interesting because you not only sort of look at your own um, uh, work life and, and also your private life in a different um, perspective when you talk to somebody else, but you also can learn a lot from, from your mentees. So, so yeah, I, I really enjoy that. Uh, right now I don't have a mentee within the company, but uh, I take every opportunity to, to do that whenever I can. AstraZeneca, if you're listening, she's available. Going back, I know you talked about authenticity, and that's a, it's a place where you've gotten to be as a leader. Um, if you were to reflect back and think, you know, I wish I had known that then. Is there mm. any piece of advice you would give to your younger self? That's a really good question. I normally answer, you know, when it comes to advice, I normally answer that, you know, I think people should look up from their everyday work and look around and listen more and take in the world. But to myself, I probably wouldn't give that <laughs> advice because I've always <laughs> really done that. So I think if it were to myself, I would probably say, be confident that y you actually will bring value and, and start acting and speaking up now. Because when I was younger, I was more listening and learning other than uh, sort of contributing actively and, and directively, if you will. So I think that's the advice I would give myself. <laughs> that's good advice. Um, now, finally, can you identify one wow moment that changed or enhanced the trajectory of your career? Yes. Um, so um, I have to really bring this back to um, uh, a, a women's summit that I went to actually in 2016 in Gothenburg. And AstraZeneca has a very um, directed effort to, to get more women in leadership positions, but also work with, uh, with uh, uh, the gender balance. And so every year we have women's summits um, on our main site. And this year, in 2016, we had a keynote speaker called Agnes Vold. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of her. She's very Swedish in a sense. But uh, in 1997, she published a nature paper about nepotism and sexism in, in peer review uh, and in nature. It was a really amazing paper. And she came to us in 2016 and presented her theories on enrichment factors and bias uh, in terms of how we make decisions for promotion and, and what that led to. What we, all, the, all the small decisions we do as leaders when it comes to uh, hiring and firing and promotion, etc., uh, and what it led to on a consolidated level. And it really opened my eyes to how important it is to be uh, thinking about bias in, in these situations when you're, when you're a, a female manager. I, I couldn't agree with you more. There's study after study that show that women just don't put themselves forward as much and that mm. there is a bias against women in promotions. Um, yes. So... I think you are hit right on a, a key point, especially so current today, right? We are living in an age of everybody's looking at gender diversity and gender equality, and we're not there yet, which is amazing. No. That, and, you know, when you think about me being Swedish originally, uh, you know, when you think about the Swedish society, they, 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 you, when you think about Sweden, it, it, equality is the first, or one of the first few things that people think about. But Agnes' uh, paper, even though it's old, it was about Sweden, and Sweden is still struggling uh, with these types of things. And, and uh, it's all in our own heads. So if we want to make something good about this. We, we have to be aware of the act, small actions we do every day and what the impact it has on other women. Absolutely, and other men. Yeah, right? absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because sometimes we, you know, the men get vilified, but in fact it's because they don't even realize what they're doing. But when yeah. you shine a light on it, they are far more receptive to thinking about how to change some of the processes or the ways they think, so... Absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm definitely not saying that it's uh, only men 
that's creating this enrichment of the funnel, if you will, from lower career levels to higher. It's uh, as many women, and this, we're all sort of subject to bias, and not being aware of what we do, I think, is the reason for why, why it happens. And, and uh, we all do it, women and men. Couldn't agree with you more. You summed it up perfectly. Mm. Anna, mm. I have so enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your personal stories and your insights on bias and how things can change for the better. And, again, I wish you continued success on your good work in addressing such a critical therapeutic need. Thank you so much, Taryn. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series. And thanks again to Cardinal Health Specialty Solutions for sponsoring this program. For more information, visit cardinalhealth.com slash specialty solutions. We also encourage you to listen to additional episodes at pharmavoice.com slash wow. This 2019 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.